New Line said early on that they wanted a roller coaster of a movie, and uh, that was in the back of my mind constructing it. September '99, I started a week before the shoot. It was a big unknown, huge unknown. We didn't know we, whether we were going to have three million feet of film, million feet of film. New Zealand films I've done in the past, Tops has been like half a million feet of film. We're getting avid storage. We're getting one and a half terabytes of storage set up and uh, six avids hooked together. Okay. Just gearing up for the biggest thing any of, any of us have ever seen. The size of the project was quite amazing. The amount of footage that was turned over through the cutting room was nothing I'd ever seen before. Normally we'd, we'd have a ratio of 12 or 15 to 1, but on this I think we end up about 150 to 1, so that's a lot of film. Some stages we had like seven and eight units out shooting, all producing footage. How many units have we got? I've lost count. There's one over here, there's one down there, there's one here, two cameras. And there's another one somewhere. Many, many units make much as much as work for the editors. Five million feet was shot, of which we printed 70%, so we'd probably have about three and a half, three and a half, four million feet probably. We actually uh, took took editing equipment out onto location and followed Peter around. They moved to uh, Methven, Edoras. Peter was going to have a little bit of time for us. We decided we would put everything in a chopper and fly the length of the South Island up over the mountains. We had a chopper ride one morning, fantastic, up the Southern Alps. We came in over the set they'd built for Edoras and uh, Peter was flying in a chopper alongside and he did a uh, an approach to Edoras. I think he was planning a shot as he sort of choppered in up the valley towards Edoras, a sort of tracking shot into Edoras. And so we landed there and we were editing in a couple of hours' time. We set it all up and dumped the computers there. We were there for four or five days, then the cut's done, we're out to Wellington and still waiting for Peter. <laughs> On a normal movie, your dailies are usually about 25 minutes long. Sitting through dailies was... Um, well, I mean, sitting through dailies was uh, great some days and excruciating on others. It's very important to watch the dailies because you do have to know what's being photographed. You have to know whether it's in focus. Yeah. You have to look at the performance of the actors and start to feel the film coming together and the characters. It's all very important information for you to know as you're going through. But we had a real difficulty on our film because, um, because of all the units that were shooting. And it was obviously vital that I watched what they were shooting too because I had to know what, other, what, what the other directors were actually doing. Um, our dailies ended up being usually three and a half to four hours long. I mean, if you can imagine that, that every day at the end of work, we had, we had to sit through screening that was as long as Ben Hur. I think the largest amount of film to go through the cutting room in a day was 50,000 feet, which would equate to, I think, roughly eight hours of, of dailies or rushes. It's usually Andrew Lesney and myself were the only ones awake at the end of it, and we slowly, as the four hours unrolled, there'd be a, uh, a chorus of snoring starting to happen. I know, I know that Barry Osborne used to, used to loyally come to dailies every single day, but usually by about halfway through, he'd be gently snoring behind us as well. I went crazy one night, <laughs> I was sitting there watching it, the horse chase sequence, which has ended up quite a brief scene in movie one. It's, I think, about a, a couple of minutes, if that. And there was hours and hours and hours of these horses charging around in circles. And we're sitting there one Friday night. It was, this was about a month into production. Someone had asked, oh, how much more of this is there? And someone up the back said, oh, I think there's one more reel. But meaning 10 minutes, actually. There was another two hours of it to go. At the end of that, that um, screening session, I was feeling a bit homesick. I went, went home, rang up the travel agent, booked a ticket ticket back to Sydney and uh, I just had to go home. It was uh, too many horses. There were some scenes that Peter, he really just wanted to be with me when I cut them. For example, Boromir, when he gets shot, he gets the arrows in him. Uh, he said, don't, don't touch that. I'll, I'll come in and cut that with you. We'll go through the material and uh, we'll pick every moment. And um, I said, OK, OK, so I put it aside. Time went by. Eventually, it, it was getting close to the point where we had to have an assembly. I said to myself, well, I won't tell them, I'll just put it together. So I, I shut myself off for a day or two, put that scene together, and it's as it is in the movie. It's, it's never been changed. Peter never looked, at, never looked at the dailies. We never went back there, so uh, I was quite pleased with that. After a couple of months of cutting, you get to see a pretty tight version of the film that matches the script. People might think, well, you know, that's, that's the film finished, you know, you've matched the script and that's exactly what you want. But it's, it's not, it never ever is, because at that point, uh, you know, problems with the script start to show, show themselves, that 
bits of the film start to drag, that uh, you put things in the script that are repeating the same piece of information twice, it's redundant. You know, things that you shot, you know, with the best intentions, you realise you didn't actually need. The story had to work for people who didn't know anything about Lord of the Rings. People who had never read the books, had never heard of Frodo. They had to understand the story from the first minute through to the end. We had to make the film work for them. Obviously, the people who haven't read the books, they aren't going to miss things that aren't in the film, which were in the books, but whereas the fans were. So there was a kind of a tension between those two things. Well, it's none of our concern what goes on beyond our borders. Keep your nose out of trouble, and no trouble will come to you. The first assembly of the film would be four and a half hours duration, all the material to together. That's a tight cut of the film, with all the scenes in there. Peter always worked on the, the principle of, if you've shot it, it should be cut, and it should be going to go into the movie in the first instance. So he wanted to put the whole movie together, with everything in it, as the first option. And then, uh, obviously it was too long, uh, we, all, we all looked at that and we thought this is too long, everyone agreed it was too long. Uh, and the next process really was to start figuring out where it's too long and whether there's any elements of the story that aren't clear. This amount of material, you're, you're conscious of how long an audience will sit there in cinema. And I think this is a special film, but three and a half hours, four hours, uh, it's just not a commercial reality. The epiphany we had was that film one really needed to be Frodo-centric. And we spent a day together in Peter's house, sort of rebashing out the story, you know, on paper, Frodo-centrically. And when you did that, suddenly you didn't have to argue about the relative merits of individual beloved scenes anymore, because it became immediately self-evident what had to, quote, go. Any time in the movie it goes away from Frodo, and it's not about him, or about the ring, or about other people's impressions of the ring, then, then we've got to have a really good reason to, to, to have it in the movie. And obviously there's scenes that we have to have, you know, when Gandalf goes to see Saruman, and there is definitely moments where it goes away from Frodo and the ring, but those are completely essential parts of the story as well. So we started to trim away material that wasn't directly related to that Frodo story, and that's really how we arrived at the theatrical cut of the film. From there on, there were, there were a few more pickups, and w it was a process of refining it. At this stage, the, everything that came out was pretty painful. There's a lot of little things from the book, which even things that set up events in film two, like Gimli falling in love with Galadriel, the gift giving in Lothlorien when they leave Lothlorien. Iconic moments from the book, I think. They're great scenes, they just, there just wasn't room for them all, so we, ha we had to toss some. On any film, it's always the beginning and the end that re you really struggle with. During the, the process of pickups and sort of revamping film one a bit and re-scripting bits and pieces, they sort of thought, well, what are we going to do about the prologue? And the prologue, you know, we, str we struggled with it, and it was the last thing we finished. It was originally written to be a seven-minute prologue on the front, front of the film, telling the backstory of the ring, Sauron, of Isildur, the failed attempt to destroy the ring. Just because of men, the ring survives. Uh, during the cut, we went away from that idea, and we tried to incorporate that material where it was relevant in the story, but it, we never made it work. It always slowed up the film there, so um, this was kind of unfinished business, and we still hadn't dealt with it. At the very last minute after we showed the picture for the last time to the studio, as Peter was leaving for London to score the picture, uh, we were faced with reinstituting the prologue and it also meant recutting the prologue and, and adding in some new visual effects. This is in June, very little time to do all this incredible amount of work. Uh, however, somehow, as, as, as always, w w the motto was, Okay, we all know this is impossible, so let's just get on with it. And that's what we did. And John Gilbert packed up his Avid uh, hard drives, and we set up an Avid in England uh, where Peter was living. So Peter would go scoring during the day and come back and work with John uh, at night to cut the uh, prologue sequence together right up to the very, very end. And Howard would have to be peeking over the shoulder, kind of figuring out the score for this sequence as it was, as it was evolving. Usually on a film, we hit a lock date, there's no more money to continue, there isn't, there isn't always the will to continue, but in this case, there was always the will to make it better. There's a lot of risk associated with shooting three films at once. There was a lot of pressure to try to make the fellowship obviously successful. The cut that you see in the movies is, it is Peter's cut. I mean, Peter didn't, while New Line had a lot of opinions about the cut, uh, there was never any actual interference in the cut. Uh, Peter was able to make the cut as he wanted it. A lot of the scenes that uh, were deleted earlier on, maybe a year ago, uh, are going back into the DVD. So how long have we been in the theatre and we're still not locked? 
<laughs> well, you've had a lot on Monday. Monday? Well, maybe. But when we pull them up, quite often we look at them and say, hey, you know, this hasn't been subjected to some of the rigour that we, the rest of the movie went through. So uh, we're going back and we're polishing them, tightening them up, maybe selecting different takes, getting the actors in to do ADR for new takes, uh, rescoring them. Uh, it's a big process. There am I, being an assembly editor on film three, but in fact, my machine's being used by the editor on film one to do the DVD. And so, what am I going to do? Sit on my butt and do nothing? I don't think so. As deep and resonant as, as the theatrical version of The Fellowship of the Ring is, this gives you all kinds of layers, especially strongly as it relates to Aragorn, his whole backstory, you know, his history, you know, what drives him. It's like peeling away layers. If you look at this extended cut, there's like at least 10 more layers of stuff that you're gonna see that uh, is just absolutely fascinating. The wonderful thing about DVDs as a different medium to cinema is that the expectations are totally different and the expectations of pace are different. And so I really think it's a great opportunity to be able to now restore back into the movie. We're not, we're not having them as a separate chapters, we're putting them back into the body of the film. About 30 minutes worth of extra footage that we have great little scenes and some actually some big scenes too. They're very often character driven scenes, they have more humour and they tell you more about a lot of the, of the characters within the film. They give you more information and more background. I have so little faith in your own people. Yes, there is weakness, there is frailty, but there is courage also and honour to be found in men. But you will not see that. There are great scenes that came out and you know it's going to be fantastic for the fans that when they're rolling down the DVD and they, they hit the new scene they're going to be they're going to get excited I think. I'm really just delighted to be able to finally make these part of an alternate version of the film and that's really what I regard the the extended DVD releases being. It's like it's like an alternate version of the same movie. It's pretty cool to finish film one, it, re it really is. Um, you know, doing this extended cut for the DVD is just putting a few things to rest, pulling some scenes out, some beautiful scenes, putting them where people can see them and then I can go, you know, I've, I've done my business and I can pass the baton to film two, you know, and to be quite honest, it was exhausting. I'm pleased to give it to them. But, uh, you know, I suspect it's like giving birth, you know, women do it. And then uh, immediately afterwards they say, I'm, I'm never doing this again. But a year or two further on down, phew, you know, it happens, it happens again.